Dearest brother, you've been gone for four months and the family misses you more and more each day. I hope you're doing well. In your last letter, you mentioned that food rations have been low for your platoon. Has your situation improved any? I wish I could say that conditions here at home are improving. Local businesses have been turning operations over to wives and daughters as the owners get called off to the front lines. Even I've been called to work. I spend my days collecting coal and scraps at the scrapyard. I hope this letter finds you well. With love, your sister Jenny. My dear sister, I don't have much time to write, so I'll update you on the most important of matters only. My platoon moved a little further south, and we were unable to restock our rations in time. So unfortunately, I continue to go to bed hungry. Rumors of spies to the east have us all on high alert. We're on orders to be ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. I don't know when I'll return home, but tell mother and father that I miss them dearly. I've lost my faith in this pointless war. We're all suffering and dying, and for what? Even if America achieves what it wants from this war, it hardly seems worth the terrible cost. Dearest mother, war is difficult, but my belief in the cause of this war and in our Tsar has never been higher. I keep a picture of our great leader, the Tsar, with me at all times to give me strength. We do not have enough food or supplies, and what we do have is ruined by the dampness of the trenches. The fighting seems constant, and many of my friends and comrades have died. Despite the horrors of war, my love for my country drives me. I have faith that we will emerge victorious from this war whenever it may end, and Russia will become even more powerful and dominant across the world. I hope you are proud of me and my contributions to our great nation. For Mother Russia! Looking at old letters is a great way to learn something about the past. We can learn about people, places, events, ideas, and even how people used to speak. In this lesson, we're going to dive into learning about tools we can use to learn about the past. We call these primary sources. Understanding and analyzing primary sources is an important competency first introduced in eighth grade and reinforced throughout upper school history. So get your time machines ready because it's time to learn about some history. Okay, okay. Before you jump into your time machine, let's take a look at the present. Over the next three slides, you will see three different pictures or blocks of text. They will be numbered one, two, and three. Your task is to look carefully at each slide, and for each one, you need to answer three questions. Number one, what is the object? Number two, who wrote or made this object? And number three, how did that person get or learn the information needed to make the object? Trust me, it'll make more sense when you see the objects. Pause the video on each slide to give yourself time to write, and then unpause the video to continue to the next slide. I'll see you soon. Time to review. Let's take a look at number one. A. What is the object? Well, it's pretty clear, right? It's a book. Some of you might have even read this one. Hmm? Now let's dive in a little deeper. Who wrote or made this object? Again, pretty clear. Some of you might even know this guy. It is Jonathan Starr, all right? Now let's go even deeper. Now how did this person, Jonathan Starr, get or learn the information needed to make the object, okay? So think. How did Jonathan get this information? That's right, by living and working at a bar so. That's how he got the information that he needed to make this source or this book, okay? Let's go on to number two. What is this object? This is a painting of the Eiffel Tower, okay? Now, going forward, it might be a little bit more difficult. So, who wrote or made this object? I 
can't see a name anywhere. And I'm pretty sure you can't either. But it's clear that it was made by an artist, right? So this artist, judging from the paint used, was an artist who liked using acrylic paints, okay? So going on to the last one. How did this artist, how did this person get or learn the information needed to make this object? Um, this is a little bit tricky. Maybe he got that information by visiting the neighborhoods around the Eiffel Tower, okay? Or maybe he's never been to Paris. It's also possible that he just saw a picture of the Eiffel Tower and then used that to make this painting. Last one. A, what is this object? It is an article about sliced mayonnaise in Japan. Raise your hand if you like sliced mayonnaise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, now who wrote or made this object? Again, there's no names, but we can figure out that it's probably a journalist, right? A journalist is someone that writes articles. Um, now let's think, if it's a journalist, how did this person get or learn the information needed to make the object? Now, similar to the do now number two, there's a couple choices here, right? So from reading the article, it seems like he looked at the packaging and he read CNET and Gizmodo. Maybe. See, if we could think about it, maybe his assistant was the one that actually read CNET and Gizmodo. We don't know if he actually had the package in his hand or if he just saw a picture on the internet. Maybe he doesn't know anything about it and this is all coming from an outside source. We just don't know, right? Hopefully you did okay on these do nows. It's okay if your answers don't completely match up to what we said, as long as it matches up with the main idea. I think now it's time to jump into your time machine. Have fun. First, we're going to go through definitions of primary sources and secondary sources. Let's start with the definition of a source. A source, is a person, document, or object that gives us information. A primary source is a source that was created by someone who directly witnessed or participated in the past that you are studying. The author knows about the historical event because they witnessed it themselves. Primary sources are really important tools for historians because they give us first-hand information about the past. That means that you can use these sources to draw your own conclusions about the past rather than relying on someone else to tell you what happened. Primary sources also offer a variety of points of view and perspective of events, issues, people, and places, and show us that two different people can view the same event in very different ways. Now let's talk about secondary sources. Secondary sources are documents, text, images, and objects about an event they were created by someone who referenced primary sources for their information. However, creators of secondary sources did not directly witness or participate in the past, but have studied it and learned about it through primary sources. Some examples of these can be textbooks, books, or essays that you might write using primary sources. Let's look at an example and try to decide whether it's a primary or a secondary source. So imagine someone is trying to write an article about the founding of a Barso school. They find a letter that a student in a Barso's first class wrote home to her parents about what classes are like here. Think about it. Is this a primary or a secondary source? Pause the video, think about your answer, and when you're ready to see what the answer is, restart the video. It's a primary source. This is a primary source because we're trying to learn about the history of a Barso and specifically how it was founded. And the author of this letter witnessed that. They were here when a Barso was first founded. And in the letter, when they write about what a Barso was like, they're using firsthand information that they themselves witnessed. This would be a great way to learn about the founding of a Barso. Now we're going to move on to some more examples. Pause the video on this slide and think about these four examples. These are all related to someone trying to study the founding of a Barso. So think about these sources. Think about how the creator of the sources would learn information about the founding of a Barso. When you're ready to see the answers, unpause the video and move on to the next slide. Are you ready? Let's check your answers. Look over these answers. If you got them all right, great. You can move on to the next part of the video. If you need a bit more review, that's fine. Just go back and rewatch this section of the video 
or look in the description for some extra practice on identifying primary sources. Now that we know what primary sources are, let's practice analyzing primary sources. We are trying to learn as much information as possible about the primary source and draw conclusions about the past from the source. Number one step to take when analyzing a primary source. Look at the source and get a first impression. If it's a document, think about the appearance. Is it handwritten? What materials are used? If there are pictures, what do you think is in, the, is in those pictures? If it's an object, what is your first thought about what it might be? Number two, examine the source carefully. Read it thoroughly. If it's a written source and then paraphrase the source section by section. Pay close attention to word choice and if it's a visual source, look for captions, labels, or any other information with the source. Number three, think about the author or creator of the source. What do we know about them? Do you see their opinions or thoughts? What do you think their perspective of the past might be? Number four, when was the source created? Can you find a date? Number five, what is the audience of the source? Who was it created for? Why was it created? Number six, after you have carefully thought about who created the source, when and why, you should think about what new perspective you learn about from the source and what new understanding you have now about the past. Number seven, what questions do you have about the source? Now, what is perspective? Perspective is the way someone is looking at something, their point of view. It is important to always keep in mind the perspective of a primary source when you're reading it. Historians know it's not always clear what the truth is about a historical event because different people might view the same event in different ways. For example, imagine you and your friend get in a fight. You both probably disagree on what happened exactly. If you both write letters to your parents about what happened, they'll probably look at it very different. Okay. Now that we've gone over how to analyze primary sources, we're going to do some guided practice with the letters that we heard at the beginning of the video. Let's start with this first example. We're going to start by just taking our first impressions of this letter and making some predictions about what we're going to learn in the source. So just by looking at the address at the top of the letter, we can learn a few things. We can learn that this is a letter addressed to somebody in the United States Army. We can also see the date. September 10th, 1917. Now, if you study World War I, you'll see that 1917 is the year that the United States begins fighting in World War I. So just from that first glance at this letter, we can make a prediction that this letter is going to give us some information about the United States at the beginning of World War I. Now, we're going to move on to the next step, which is reading carefully. So pause the video, read through this letter carefully, and when you're ready to get back into analyzing, restart the video. Okay, did you read it carefully? Let's talk about some things we can learn from this letter. So first, we learned that our author is the sister of a soldier fighting in the war. We can also see that in the United States, times are pretty tough right now. A lot of people are fighting in the war, so the author is working in ways that she didn't have to before the war. We also learn that she's really worried about her brother. We know that the source is a letter, and we know the intended audience of the source is her brother. So this letter is giving us a lot of personal information about what her life was like. This source also gives us the perspective of a woman in the United States during the war, and it shows us how life changed a lot for women and for everyone in the United States. Okay, let's look at the next example. So, Let's start with our first impressions of what this letter can tell us. Again, we can see from the address that this is addressed to Jenny, the author of our last letter. We see that she's living in Illinois in the United States, and we can see from the date that this is about a month after the first letter we looked at. So from that, we can guess that this is a reply to the first letter we looked at, and it's also from around the same time period. So it can tell us a little bit about what it was like to be in the United States Army at the beginning of World War I. Now we're gonna move on to reading the letter carefully. So again, pause the video, read through carefully, and when you're ready to get back into analyzing, restart the video. Okay, ready to start talking about this? Great. So let's start by thinking about our author. 
So we learned that the author of this letter is fighting in the war, and he's really facing a lot of problems. It sounds like fighting in the war is really hard. We see a lot of this author's perspective. He seems really angry and frustrated. He doesn't want to fight in the war, and he thinks the war is not being fought for good reasons. This primary source tells us that this author felt that the war was bad and not worth being fought. However, we can't assume that all soldiers felt the way that this soldier feels. This soldier also gives us some information about what the lives of soldiers in the United States Army in 1917 were like. They didn't have enough supplies and lived in really rough conditions. So this letter gives us a really interesting perspective from one soldier fighting in the Army. Now, let's look at a third letter that shows us a different perspective, also from someone fighting in the war. Okay, this is the last letter. Again, let's start with our first impressions. Look at who it's addressed to. It's someone living in Russia, right? So we can tell that this letter is probably giving us a different perspective than the letters written by Americans that we saw before. You can also see the date, 1916. Now again, if you look at the dates for World War I, you'll see the war begins in 1914, and Russia begins fighting right away. So this letter's from about two years after Russia begins fighting in the war. So we can guess that this is gonna tell us a little bit about what it was like to be in Russia during the war. Now, pause the video, read carefully, and when you're ready to start analyzing, unpause the video. Great. Let's think about the perspective and what we can learn about this author. So this author has a much different perspective than the last letter we saw, right? This author is very proud to be fighting in the war. As he's telling his mother, he's happy to fight for his country. He's patriotic, he loves the leader of Russia, known as the Tsar, and he believes that this war is a good thing for Russia. America and Russia were allies during World War I. That means they fought on the same side. However, we can see that two different soldiers had very different perspectives of this war and felt very different things about what it was like. As these sources are showing you, one primary source only gives you one perspective on an event in history. You can't assume that everyone in history views the events in the same way. That's why it's important to look at many different primary sources to get an idea of the whole range of perspectives people might have. Take a look at the next few slides. They show sources all about the Spanish flu pandemic, a dangerous illness that swept across the world in 1918. Here is a link to a helpful article. The link to this article is in the description of the video below. Now use the primary sources from the previous slides to help you answer these questions. Take your time to examine the primary sources and make sure you answer the correct questions for your grade. Now pause this video and carefully read through the instructions and we start whenever you're ready. Whew. What a bumpy ride on the time machine, am I right? Oh, it's good to be back in the present though. All right, so if at any point you felt lost or confused or unsure about practicing any of these questions, don't hesitate to refer back to the prior examples in this lesson. Also, check in the description box below to online resources for further reading information and practice on today's lesson. Hope you learned a lot and I'll see you in the next video. And until then, bye!